Good evening. Thank you very much for uh, attending this evening's session. And I think you'll all find uh, this to be a very interesting discussion. I'm the registrar of the ICTY, the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, uh, John Hocking. 140,000 people were murdered, millions displaced, and some 70,000 victims of sexual crimes in the conflicts in the former Yugoslavia. And faced with, this, um, with the tragedy of this magnitude and the norm that those most responsible would never see their day in court, many feared that a new tribunal in The Hague could not do much. And while no tribunal is or, or can be a panacea, this tribunal made what seemed utopistic possible. In less than a generation, the ICTY has shown that justice is possible, possible even in the face of genocide and atrocity crimes, possible even where the alleged perpetrators were once considered untouchable and beyond the law. The ICTY has given voice to 5,000 victims, 5,000 witnesses, who've come before the, uh, appeared at the, at the courts in the, at the ICTY in The Hague, and they've brought solace to, to many of the survivors. The ICTY has established facts. It's clarified the law. And with its groundbreaking rulings from wartime sexual violence to cultural heritage destruction, the ICTY has given durable tools to courts to policymakers and civil society all over the world, which today makes the ICTY's legacy immortal and the global fight for justice irreversible. Among these tools is the ICTY's pioneering contribution to the development of international humanitarian law. And with 80% of victims of armed conflicts since 1945, victims of non-international armed conflicts, I'm grateful to the International Institute of Humanitarian Law for the opportunity to highlight the ICTY IHL legacy at this round table honoring the 40th anniversary of the additional pro protocols and to do so with such an eminent panel. Judges, practitioners, academics, they're going to give us their hands-on experience which has contributed to the ICTY becoming a driver in the development of IHL, from the seminal Appeals Chamber Tadic decision on jurisdiction, through the trials arising from the siege of Sarajevo and the shelling of Dubrovnik, to the impact on other jurisdictions. But before introducing our speakers, I would be Remiss not to salute Dr. Miguel de Sepa Suarez, the United Nations Legal Counsel, whose engagement brings international law and justice to greater heights every day. Now, we've circulated the panel members' bios, uh, but I'd like to just uh, present each of our panel members with a few broad strokes. And first on my right, let me introduce Judge Lou Dashun, the Vice President of the ICTY. Judge Lou's been an ICTY judge since 2000. He also serves as a judge on the mechanism for international criminal tribunals. Judge Lou's international law legacy has been forever memorialized in the almost 50 judgments he's penned in ICTY and ICTR cases and his earlier contributions to the Foreign Ministry of the People's Republic of China. More personally, I'm privileged to have experienced firsthand how Judge Liu's legacy lives on every day in the thousands of promising young minds that he has taught, that he's mentored, and that he's imbued with the values of hard work, justice, and humanity. The ancient Romans, I'm told, used to say, nomen omen, our destiny is in our name. And I understand that Judge Lu's first name, Dashun, refers to a big person, uh, a big crowd, and ultimately a modest person caring for all of us. 
Judge Liu, you have fully embraced your destiny. Judge Poka, another big, caring person who has dedicated his life to the making of justice and the outreach of justice. Judge Fausto Poka, the grand patron of this institute who needs no introduction in San Remo, um, has been an ICTY judge for nearly two decades. Judge Poka was the tribunal's, the ICTY's president during its most prolific years from 2005 to 2008. And Judge Poka is, if you don't mind me saying, a brilliant mind of our time. The lucidity of his reasoning, his forward-thinking approach uh, are abundantly evident in his scholarship and his work. And Judge Poka has reached deep into the heart of the communities most affected by the ICT's, ICTY's work. He's been a tireless champion and driving force behind the creation of information centres in the Balkans, where victims and their families who've not, been, who've not appeared in our courtrooms can share and learn about our work and hopefully move towards reconciliation. So thank you, Judge. Next, at the right side here, is uh, Professor Patricia, excuse me, Patricia Sellers Visser, the winner of the American Society of International Law Prominent Women in International Law Award. She is now a special advisor to the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court. And this morning, uh, Patricia shared with us the very interesting developments at the ICC in the Ntaganda case, in which the appeals chamber confirmed that rape and sexual slavery could be war crimes, even if committed by members of an armed group against fellow members of their own group. Uh, Professor Sellers started at the ICTY back in 1994, just a short time after the Security Council had actually adopted its founding resolutions. And for 13 years, she litigated and advised the prosecutor of the ICTY and the ICTR on landmark cases such as Akayesu, Kunarach, Furunjia, and left her mark on the ad hoc tribunal's legacy in the prosecution of sexual and gender-based violence. I think it's also fair to say that thanks to Professor Sellers, today sexual wartime violence is no longer regarded as a silent scourge or mere collateral damage, but it is denounced for what it is, a crime that can also be an act of genocide. And our final panelist on my left, Professor Susanna Linton, I also met in the last century at the ICTY when she was assisting Judge Cassese and Judge Mumba, and it is the last century. Um, Susanna's commitment to human rights and international law has brought her all over the world, from Bosnia to East Timor, from Cambodia to Moldova, from the UK to Hong Kong, where she's worked for the UN, for tribunals, international organisations, and in prestigious universities. She's now found a home in China, in uh, Hongzhou, and Judge Liu, if I remember correctly, the saying is, in heaven there is paradise, and on earth there is Hong Hangzhou. Uh, and Susanna is a distinguished professor at the Zhejiang Gongsheng University School of Law. She's also presently co-leading a major project on international humanitarian law from the Asia Pacific, and I hope we'll get a preview of that. A free uh, copy. Oh, or even a free copy this evening. <laughs> So, that was my short introduction to our panel members. So let's focus now on the substance of this discussion and going back to the early days in the 1990s. And the ICTY statute, when it was adopted by the Security Council in 1993, did not make specific reference to the additional protocols. However, in 1995, 1995 the ICTY Appeals Chamber in the Tadic decision on jurisdiction, um, decided that the protocols were in fact applicable under the ICTY's Article 3 on the laws and customs of war. So I'd like to start the discussion by turning to Judge Pokar and asking him why the additional protocols 
were not specifically included in the ICTY statute. Thank you, John. I, of course, was not uh, there when the, the uh, statute was drafted uh, very quickly. In, uh, I think the OILA had a very uh, had a mandate to speed up and, and bring in a couple of months a text of a statute. Um, I don't know exactly why the protocols were not uh, were not uh, mentioned as applicable law, um, but uh, if I read uh, the report of the Secretary General to the Security Council accompanying the uh, statute, the draft statute, I guess that uh, the, uh, that was because, unlike the Geneva Conventions, the protocols are not regarded unanimously as being uh, uh, become customary law. Uh, there is uh, a general opinion that the Geneva Conventions reflect customary law, but as to the protocols, there are some rules they reflect overall customary law, but there are some rules that are challenged as being customary law. And uh, the, uh, the Secretary General <laughs> believed uh, that, or the Office of the Legal Counsel at the time, uh, believed that there would have been a problem in mentioning the protocols. Because if they are not customary law, they should have been applied qua treaties. And uh, were the treaties applicable in the conflict or not? Uh, you know that the countries, the republics of the former Yugoslavia uh, split, separated from uh, Yugoslavia, not at the same time and uh, during the conflict, to a large extent. So the, the question that uh, probably the uh, Secretary General put uh, himself, or the legal counsel put himself, was uh, are these treaties that the former Yugoslavia had ratified automatically applicable to the successor states? And uh, my feeling is that uh, the uh, legal counsel was not persuaded of that. I think it was wrong, simply. I was simply it was wrong. Uh, at the same time, I had to deal with this matter as president of the Human Rights Committee. And the Human Rights Committee, we take the opposite position. We said, automatically, human rights treaty, humanitarian law treaties um, apply to, uh, to successor states. Uh, that was the opinion also of the successor states themselves, at, or some of them at least, but uh, um, the, probably the, the legal counsel thought it was safer not to do that. And that's why the report deals with the, says this tribunal should apply customary law only. But of course the response of Cassese and his uh, colleagues at the time in Tadic was, well, we have to apply customary law, and we apply customary law. We go through, uh, through article, common article 3, we made a long reason here, don't uh, deal with that, and apply customary law. Where all the provisions mention customary law or not, that is a different issue. But uh, the fact uh, is that in, in Tadish there is not only the reference to customary law, but it's also said that they can be applied as treaties, as treaties. And the report of the, of the Secretary General did not exclude that because said that treaties can be applied if uh, uh, they are applicable. So didn't left the room for saying that those treaties can be applied. So this, this is the status of the, of the affairs. In my view, it was a wrong position, but uh, I understand that being in that situation could be take a different position, could, could meet criticism of uh, governments, uh, states, uh, uh, 
probably had more courage in the Human Rights Committee. I mean, uh, that was a position that was taken strongly by me as president together with the British uh, member of the committee that was uh, the well-known and well-known uh, as being a, a great lawyer, uh, Rosalind Higgins, that then became president of the ICJ. Thank you very much, Judge Poker. By the way, I don't intend to sum up the presentations because I'd like to save no, time at the end for, for questions. Yes, thanks. Um, two notable areas developed by the protocols have been the expansion of the rules applicable to non-international armed conflict in additional Protocol 2 and the inclusion of rules relating to the conduct of hostilities in both additional protocol one and to some extent in additional protocol two. I now want to turn to Judge Liu and to ask how has the ICTY contributed to the development and implementation of IHL and in general and um, the additional protocols in particular. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. John Hawking, Mr. President uh, Judge Poka, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. It is a great honor for me to have been invited to take part in this panel to discuss the contribution of the ICTY to international humanitarian law. Judge Argis, the president of the ICTY, could not come here because of some previous arrangement. He asked me to convey his best wishes to the success of this conference. Lots has already been said and written about this topic over the years. However, in light of the 40th anniversary of the adoption of the Additional Protocol 1 and 2 to the Geneva Conventions of 1949, my intervention today will focus on the brief overview of the relationship between the ICTY and the two additional protocols. I will in particular explain how the additional protocol one and two have been used and relied upon in the ICTY jurisprudence to show how the ICTY contributed to the development of the international humanitarian law in this respect. I'll leave it to my learned colleague, Judge Pokan, to go into more detailed ex examples from our jurisprudence. It is indisputable that the additional protocol one and two to the Geneva Convention of 1949 significantly improved the legal protection of the civilians and the victims afforded by the four Geneva Conventions of 1949. The gaps in the protection filed by the two additional protocols in relation to the protection against the attacks directed against the civilians and the civilian objects, and the expansion of the protection in the context of non-international armed conflict have not remained unnoticed by the ICTY. As we will see, the reliance in the ICTY jurisprudence to the two additional protocols have been both extensive and abroad. However, reliance by the ICTY on the two additional protocols was not obvious to begin with. As mentioned by Mr. John Hawking in introduction, contrary to the ICTR statute, which contains a reference to the additional protocol two, there's no mention of the additional protocol one and two in the statute of the ICTY. Nevertheless, as early as in 1995, the Tadic decision on the jurisprudence made clear that Article 3 of the statute related to the jurisdiction to prosecute violence of the laws or customs of war was, generally, was a general clause intended to provide the international tribunal with the power to prosecute all the serious violations of the international humanitarian law. For an offense to be subject to the prosecution pursuant to Article 3 of the Tribunal's statute, it must fulfill the following criteria. First, 
the violation must constitute a infringement of the rules of the international humanitarian law. Second, the rule must be customary in nature or it belongs to treaty law. That required conditions must be met. Thirdly, the violation must be serious. That is to say, it must constitute a breach of the rule protecting important values, and the breach must involve the grave consequences for the victims. And fourthly, the violation must entail in the customary or conventional law the individual criminal responsibility of the person breaching the rules. The purpose of this criteria was to ensure that the principle non lam crime sine lec was respected. From that point onwards, the ICTY has been extensively referring to the Hague law, but also additional protocol one and two to define the violations of the laws or customs of war that the tribunal could prosecute. The additional protocols has been particularly important to identify what could constitute a violation of the rules of international humanitarian law and whether a particular rule was customary law or part of the agreement binding to the parties. Reference to additional protocol one and two in the ICTY jurisprudence can be found, for instance, in relation to the finding that hostage taking and pillage was prohibited under international humanitarian law. Other examples are the ICTY reliance on the additional protocols to define the forcible transfer and the deportation or the offenses of the outrages upon the personal dignity. <coughs> One of the most striking examples, in my view, of the reliance and the interpretation of the additional protocol by the ICTY relates to the crimes of terror. The definition of the offense of the unlawful inflicting terror upon civilians recognized by the tribunal as a violation of the laws and the customs of war pursuant to Article 3 of the statute was directed to important, imported from the Article 51 of the additional protocol 1 and Article 13 of the Additional Protocol 2, which both state the civilian population as such, as well as individual civilians, shall not be the subject of attack. Acts or threats of violence, the primary purpose of which is to spread terror among the civilian populations, are prohibited. For instance, in the garbage, the appeals chamber had to interpret Article 51.2 of the Additional Protocol 1 in order to conclude that the actual ter terrorization of the civilian populations was not an element of the crime, but rather the mens rea of the crime encompasses the special intent to spread the terror among the civilian population. In the same case, the appeals chamber further considered that the articles relating to inflating terror upon civilians from the additional protocols constitute a form of affirmation of the existing of the customary international law at the time of the adoption of the additional protocols. However, it is certainly in relation to the offenses related to unlawful attacks on the civilians and the civilian objects that the ICTY relied and referred to the most heavily on the additional protocols. Nothing surprising since improving the protection against the attacks on civilians and the civilian objects is one of the main contribution of the humanitarian law of the adoption of the addi additional protocols. For instance, in Cordage and the Circuit case, the appeals chamber found that Prohibition against attacking civilians stems from the fundamental principle of the international humanitarian law mentioned in Article 48 of the Additional Protocol 1 of the principle of distinction. This principle obliged to distinguish at all the times between the civilian population and the combatants, between the civilian objects and the military objectives, and thus to direct a military operation only against uh, military objectives. 
the definition of the elements of defense, such as the attack, the fact that the civilian population cannot be object of the attack, the definition of the civilians, the civilian population and the civilian objects, all stem from the reliance and the interpretation of the additional protocol one by the ICTY. The ICTY also heavily and expressly relied on Article 52 of Additional Protocol 1 to define the exceptions of the civilian taking direct, directly part in the hospitalities of the military necessity. I believe that Judge Poka will expand on this particular issue in his presentation, so I limit myself to only mentioning this. Rather, I will expand in another related examples, the crime of destruction or willful damage done to institutions dedicated to religion, charity, education, and art and science, historical monuments, and the works of art and science, as violations of the laws and the custom of wars in the Article 3D of the statute. This provision reflects the wording of the 1907 Hague Regulation rather than one of the 1954 Hague Convention on the additional, all the additional protocols. However, when it comes to determine the scope of the application of the offenses, the ICTY relied heavily on the various protections afforded by international humanitarian law to cultural properties and in particular on Article 52 and 53 of Additional Protocol 1 and the equi equivalent articles in Additional Protocol 2 for non-international armed conflict. For, for instance, in the Kodish and, and the Sakitich, the Appeals Chamber explained that the international instruments provided two types of the protection for cultural, historical, and religious monuments. The first is the general protection provided under the Article 52 of Additional Protocol 1 that the buildings or monuments cannot be destroyed unless it has been turned into a military object at the time of the attack. Schools and places of worship are part of this category of the buildings, category of these buildings. It added that a second category category of the objects, historical monuments, works of art, and places of worship were given a special protection by virtue of the Article 53 of the Additional Protocol 1 and the 1954, the Hague Convention, for the protection of the cultural property during armed conflict as they constitute the cultural or spiritual heritage of the people. Therefore, the ICTY in the, <coughs> excuse me, the ICTY in defi defining Article 3D of the statute ended up the protecting cultural property in two ways, mirroring the protection afforded by Article 52 and 53 of the additional Protocol 1, property defined as institutes dedicated to religion, charity, and education, the art and the science historical monument and the work of art and science. Like any other civilian objects are protected against attacks as long as they are not military objectives. While cultural property of great importance to the cultural heritage of the peoples, like historical monuments, works of art, places of worship, are offered a special protection. The ICTY has not specifically ruled on what this special protection entails, but the 1954 Hague Convention provides that the obligation not to attack cultural property may be waived only where military necessity imperatively requires such a waiver, makes it more protective than the reference to the military objectives of the Article 51. Moreover, Article 53 of Additional Protocol 1 does not even mention any waiver as a lawful military objectives when cultural property is used for military purpose. As these examples clearly show, the ICTY has been contributing to the interpretation of the 
additional protocol one and two, and make extensive reliance of them when it comes to define the violence of laws and the customs of war and the Article Three of the statute. Nevertheless, the interaction between additional protocols of 1977 and the jurisprudence of the ICTY go far beyond the recognition and the definition of the war crimes in international humanitarian law. In this regard, I would like to mention two particular examples. First, Additional Protocol 1, and in particular Articles 86 and 87, has been extensively relied upon by the ICTY to delineate the criminal responsibility of the superior. Indeed, the ICTY have held the criminal responsibility in the Article 7.3 for command responsibility is based primarily on the Article 86.2 of Additional Protocol 1. It is the settled jurisprudence of the tribunal that at least by early 1990s, command responsibility in the course of the internal armed conflict was part of the international customary law. Contributions of the ICTY's jurisprudence to the doctrine of the command responsibility are numerous. To limit this presentation to the interactions with additional Protocol 1, we can mention the reliance on the wording of the Article 86 and the 87 Additional Protocol 1 to define de facto and de jure power of the superior, as well as the definition of the necessary and the reasonable measures that a superior could take to prevent or to punish the perpetrators. The Appeals Chamber also clarified that use of the word commit in Article 86.2 of the Additional Protocol 1, as well as in Article 7.3 of the Statute, was not intended to limit a superior obligation to prevent or punish only those individuals who physically committed the material element of a crime and to execute the subordinates who are accomplices, substantially contributed to the completion of the crime. In light of the above, there is no doubt, in my view, that the ICTY's jurisprudence have extensively contributed to the delineation of the customary international rules of the command responsibility for failure to prevent, repress, and report war crimes. Both sets of the rules mutually influenced and reinforced each other in relation to the command responsibility. Second, in relation to the crimes against humanity in Article 5 of the Statute, it is well established that in order to constitute a crime against humanity, the acts of accused must be part of the widespread or systematic attack directed against the civilian population. In order to define the civilian population for the Shapur element of the crime against humanity, the ICTY expressly relied on the additional Protocol 1. The Appeals Chamber in Blaskich case found that Article 50 of the additional Protocol 1 contains a definition of the civilians and the civilian populations, which may largely be viewed as reflecting the customary law, and that as a result, those definitions were also relevant to define civilian population in the context of the uh, of the crimes against humanity. In the same case, it was also stated that the presence within the civilian population of the individuals who do not come within the definition of the civilians does not deprive the population of its civilian characters. And the appeals chamber relied on the ICRC commentary to Article 50 of the Additional Protocol 1 to find that in order to determine whether the presence of soldiers within the civilian population deprives the population of its civilian character, the number of the soldiers, as well as whether they are on leave, must be examined. This general overview shows, in my opinion, 
the importance of the interactions and the influence between the jurisprudence of the tribunal and the additional protocols. It clearly demonstrates that ICTY has significantly contributed to the application of the additional protocols, and more broadly, the development and the understanding of international humanitarian law. Even though this time-limited presentation only touches superficially on the issue, I'm certain that we will have occasions to go deeper into some of those issues during the discussions. After the presentation, made by the other members of this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Judge Liu. An important topic at this roundtable has been the integration of a gender perspective into IHL. And um, we uh, are generally aware, Patricia, of the the ICTY's legacy in, to use a, a well-known term, surfacing sexual violence, especially rape during armed conflict. Is there, I wanted to ask you if there's another manner that we can look at this significant contribution beyond the number of sexual assault counts in an indictment? Right, thank you very much for the question. I certainly think there is. I'm going to deviate just a tiny bit from the topic of the additional protocols. I think one thing that one can look back at the ICT as having done or having tried to do is to be a judicial mechanism and institute a form of perspective for sexual violence and eventually a gender perspective. And by that I want to mean that we had to be an institution that first of all recognized a mandate within our statute that entailed sexual violence, not just because of rape under crimes against humanity, but because of the other expressed crimes, such as torture or such as cruel treatment. We had to decide that we needed gender neutral definitions so that it wouldn't be just sexual violence in terms of females, girls, or women, but also in terms of males. But then we had to do the really hard work, getting investigators so that we could have, and I was delighted to hear this phrase in the last panel, mixed teams. Uh, you can imagine that some of the male investigators who came, the last thing they wanted to do, they'd come to look at massive depths. They'd come to really kind of be the top cowboys in the investigation world, and they didn't come to look at rapes. So we had to look for female investigators, but then assure the female investigators that you're not just here for rape, you're here for every type of case that we might have and to let the male investigators to know that you're supposed to thoroughly investigate the sexual violence when you came upon it. And that slowly broadened into other gender perspectives. Also as an institution that had to realize that the senior trial attorneys had to be male and female. And that the less than senior trial attorneys, the legal officers, also needed to be in quotes, gendered mix. Up until today, we've never had a chief of investigation who was female, but we've had a couple of commanders who were females. But I do want to say that our senior trial team now is fairly uh, mixed in terms of males and females. We had to be an organization that to the outside world, we weren't just talking about what we hoped to do and never did it in terms of gender and sexual violence. We actually had to produce it. But the Office of the Prosecutor had to produce it only by thoroughly investigating and presenting good substantive legal arguments because now you understand the types of judges that we were in front of. <laughs> so <laughs> that was no easy feat. So I would like to say that one of the ICTY's legacies has been the publication recently of a book of the prosecution of sexual violence. And I know that there are many um, documents that come out of institutions when they're about to close, and they're usually called lessons learned. And I think that the book on the prosecution of sexual violence should be more aptly referred to as lessons lived. And some days it was easier to live than other days. Toward the end, it became much, much easier. And I do have to say that there is a type of gender perspective that exists at the ICTY now, whether it be within the investigations, whether it be in the prosecution, the submission, that has almost, and I want to say almost normalized what should have been normal since 1994, that both women and men, boys and girls, can be attacked via their sexual integrity, 
and that the mandates of these statutes are not selective of let's just look for some of the poor raped women, but what they're really trying to do is protect the international community from sexual violence. We, the international community. And that really the lessons of the ICTY have embodied the institutional struggle to get to that normalcy, beyond counting just the sexual assault counts. Thank you very much, Patricia. I know you have a plane to catch, but I would yes. very much like to ask you two more questions, and I'm sure the members of the audience will probably fire a few more at you if you're able to stay. But sexual violence um, and genocide, and, and this is a, a subject, of course, that is often associated with the horrors of the um, Rwandan genocide and the, the work of the Rwandan tribunal, the ICT. Ah, but I wonder if, if you could talk a bit about if there are notable outcomes for the ICTY in this respect. Yes, as a matter of fact, I was very pleased when Professor Venturi gave a very good analysis of if we have a gendered manner of analyzing the law, we'll be able to look at it as kind of a weather belt to touch what have been our good outcomes. And believe it or not, the gender analysis of the Srebrenica, and I'll say massacre as opposed to genocide, and you'll see why in a moment, the gender analysis of the Srebrenica massacre is probably unknown, not thought of. And so I just want to give you a quick five-minute uh, perspective on that. We know that in Srebrenica, what we had was a gender separation of males and females. The males, supposedly of military age, were led off to be killed. That's a, a gender crime. And they were killed with the intent to destroy and hold apart a population. So now we have a genocide. And we know that in the Rwanda tribunal, the sexual violence that occurred against the Tutsi women, often right before they died, became an act of genocide called causing serious bodily mental harm. Well, because of that holding from Rwanda, we started looking at the Srebrenica genocide differently. First, in the first cases, we just looked at the killing of the men, and everyone was satisfied, this is what genocide is, count a whole lot of male bodies. And then we said, well, how about the men who weren't killed, who miraculously survived, but were wounded? Uh, did a genocidal act occur against them? They said, well, yes, causing serious bodily and mental harm to members of the group. And thank goodness they survived. And then the next question was, well, what about this gendered separation? The women, elderly men and children who were sent out of the Potichari district did any genocidal act occur to them? And at first it was, well, no, but their deportation was evidence of intent to commit a genocide. But successive cases have now looked at that conglomerate set of facts and are reaching conclusions such as, the men who were killed, two acts of genocide occurred to them. Prior to them being killed, just knowing that they'd been separated out to be massacred, causing serious vital mental harm occurred to them, and then the killing and then the men who survived causing serious vital mental harm to them. And then eventually, the group of persons who were deported out who were basically female, causing serious vital mental harm to them, knowing not only members of the community had been killed, but that they had had the mental harm of being separated from those who would be killed. As the cases, the Shrebrenica, the subbody of cases evolve, they go and look and see if we're separating out the men and the women and that combination of the killings and the deportation, was that conditions calculated about to bring about physical destruction, another genocidal act? The courts have found, no, that's not what they would have called it, but it was because of how the prosecutor presented some of the evidence. In the most recent case, Karadich, the delineation from a gendered perspective of the Srebrenica genocide is really a legacy of having used a gender analysis on the males and the females, those who lived, the elderly men, and those who did not live. And what the court comes down to say now is that there was certainly an underlying reproductive factor within that genocide. And that by having killed the males and separated out the population of females who could have reproduced but now do not reproduce, that that was an act of the danger of the genocide that had to be part of the genocide intent. It leaves the question of whether the Srebrenica genocide continues 
until the population of females or young children dies out. But that's the end part of a gender analysis that we've gotten from looking at sexual violence first within this ad hoc tribunal. You, <clears throat> last question, are you satisfied, um, if I could use that word, with the ICTY's jurisprudence on, on sexual violence and, and perhaps more broadly um, on gender? Well, if I were satisfied, it would be too easy, right? Then you'd go home. No. I think we've had an imperfect success. Uh, some of the things that we've done, I think, very well was putting gender on the table and particularly sexual violence. Uh, we have an, I think, uh, insufficient but a substantial caseload in terms of male sexual violence. And male sexual violence, I think, is uh, Judge Liu brought something up that was very important. Our first use of command responsibility uh, incurred in a case that dealt with male sexual violence with Chelabichi uh, trial, Dalalaj. Uh, so I am very pleased with many of the aspects, and I think that there was so much more that we could have done, and that we certainly should be doing in the other courts and tribunals, and in our national courts. Thank you, and I, I actually, I remember the Chelabichi, um, the trial, and the, it was not actually pled the, uh, as part of the indictment. The, right. the, that aspect, but it was um, pronounced. It was um, discussed in the judgment itself. Thank you very much, uh, Patricia Sellers. I'd like to now go back to Judge Foka, as promised, um, and ask if we could look at some of the specific legal areas, perhaps to explore in a little more detail that have been uh, developed through the ICTY jurisprudence. And the first, um, there's the Tadic jurisdiction decision, individual criminal responsibility in a non-international armed conflict. Thank you. Well, I, I believe that um, what was worrying really the first team of judges was that uh, um, you, uh, under the statutes, you had uh, the application of the um, grave breaches uh, uh, solution in the in, for international conflicts, but you didn't have the equivalent for non-international conflicts actually, and the statute uh, refers to uh, to the Geneva Conventions, which basically deal with international conflicts. Uh, the, even applying the protocols, uh, the uh, protocols 77 do not extend, although it was proposed during the negotiations, the grave breaches regime to NIACs. So the real problem when you, they, they had to face was having a conflict that was um, mixed uh, to a large extent international conflicts in some places, some areas, in some situations, and uh, uh, to a large extent, non-international conflicts on the other side. And that had to be resolved some way, and the Tadish was essentially dedicated to that, to uh, have the situations that were equivalent, uh, and to decide that to apply the same criteria in these situations, where the statute was a bit uh, uh, not very, I would say, not uh, allowing that very explicitly. Uh, now, uh, by, the, by using custom and international law, uh, the Tadic uh, decision allowed to take into account the NIACs, the same. But uh, that was not the end, uh, end of the story. I can't go in all the details of the Tadis decision. It was not the end of the story, because uh, it came in other cases as well. And um, uh, one of the uh, cases in which this happened is torture. Torture um, is... Uh, under customary law, you can go in one way, but unfortunately, we have a convention on torture, 1984. That uh, is uh, regarded as uh, reflecting customary international law. And what happened in the Furunja case 
was that it was done, indeed. The Furunge Peel Chamber declares that uh, uh, torture is, uh, uh, the torture convention reflects custom and international law. Mm -hmm. Just ask you, uh, to just interrupt for one minute. Because yeah, sure. Professor Sellers needs to get her, but I just, perhaps we could just give a round of applause for her contribution. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Now, that was a, that was a case, it's a, it's a long story, but I make it short. Um, in, in the Furunja case, we had a case of torture committed by, by means of rape, and was charged as such, torture committed by rape, by a public officer that was a soldier of the, of the Croatian army. Now, the Convention of 84 declares, in the definition of torture, that torture has to be committed by a public officer. So no problem. The Convention reflects, it was enough to say the Convention reflects custom and internal law. You don't apply the Convention, you apply custom and international law, and you uh, convict that, uh, that person uh, as responsible for torture. But what happens in the NIAC? You have non-state actors that are not public officers. So what you do? The case immediately arrived after that was the Konarich case. It contains the rape, it contains the torture. In that case, the prosecutor charged rape and torture as separate crimes and asked the, the, the tribunal to apply the law and uh, convict for rape and torture, uh, alternatively or cumulatively. So leave, left open all the possibilities in that case. And what you do when you have declared that the convention reflects the notion of torture. Are you going for rape under custom and international law, acquitting for torture because it's not in the convention? The solution was uh, that, uh, uh, you see, courts uh, try to be consistent with the precedent. And uh, to be consistent, the Kunaraj Appeal Chamber declared that indeed the convention reflects custom and international law. But then added, but did it exhaust custom and international law? So being Reflecting customer law doesn't mean the customer international law doesn't have a wider scope. And uh, uh, building on uh, the covenant, on Article 7 on the covenant, which does not put any restriction, uh, building on the case law of the Human Rights Committee, uh, because the general comment says that torture can be committed by other subjects, doesn't, not only public officers, uh, came to the conclusion that customary international law uh, had a wider scope. And uh, at that point, uh, realized that there was the, the, the concluded there was the, the crime of torture and the crime of rape, and come to the conclusion that could convict cumulatively uh, for, for, both, uh, for both crimes. This was a really difficult decision, but it was a difficult decision to decide on the NIACs. Because on the other hand, it's a sort of continuation of the Tadic. Uh, at the end, uh, what was uh, the basis for the Tadic decision? Was the common sense. Is a crime committed in an international conflict a crime because the conflict is international? The same crime, same situation committed in a non-international conflict is not a crime? If you ask a non-lawyer, would we'll say, why? Lawyers make distinctions sometimes, but the common sense at a certain moment should, uh, should, uh, should prevail. Would you like to um, add or expand on any other cases? Uh, for example, well, conduct of well, hostility. Well, point that was mentioned by Patricia before. It's not not the case specifically, but the question. She spoke. Uh, uh, she she spoke uh, of the 
mental harm on the question of Srebrenica and introduced a point which is very important in law, uh, how far is the psychological element an element in this type of crimes? And having heard many uh, witnesses in the Konarach case affected by these uh, situations uh, of sexual violence, I have come to the conclusion that the psychological element is very important. The mental harm is extremely important. And uh, in the same case, uh, uh, something was uh, evoked this morning, and uh, the crime of enslavement. The crime of enslavement has a, a material element, of course, you exercise power over a person, but uh, is the, what kind of power? Physical or psychological, or mental? Um, the, the case was uh, of uh, two women that were enslaved by, uh, by, by men, soldiers, and kept in, a, in a, an apartment where they had to do the housework, prepare the dinner, prepare the food for the evening. The evening, these two people, or one people essentially, one person essentially that uh, uh, ran the house, managed the house, came with friends, soldiers, and uh, this, uh, these two girls were raped uh, systematically. <coughs> so there was a classical case of enslavement, if you want. But the defense came with a piece of evidence that, in their view, was uh, resolving the case. Came with evidence that the two girls had the key of the apartment, so could go out any time. Not only they went out, there was the, the testimony of, uh, of, the, of people in the shops downstairs. They went down to buy the food to prepare for the evening. So the defense said, well, they were free. They could go anywhere. They could escape. And indeed, they could in place. But here it comes the evidence of the psychological side. The situation in which they were was so psychologically coercive that they would not dare even going out. So that was very important, the psychological. I think it was a great contribution to this kind of, uh, of crimes. It was applied in other cases as well, but this is the only of enslavement that exists, this only case. And I think we're, um, not because I participated in that, I think uh, we did a very important contribution to the, to the law and to the definition of international crimes. Thank you very, very much. And I'll now just directly to Susanna Linton. Um, and you worked, of course, as I said, at the ICTY in the early days. But since then, you've done a significant amount of work on accountability in the Asia Pacific region. So uh, perhaps now you could tell us about how the ICTY's additional protocol jurisprudence, if I call it that, has been used in these jurisdictions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, um, good evening, everybody. Um, I realize it's 7.25. Um, I have a fair amount of pages to get through, and I'll, I'll get, get, get through the, 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 the highlights um, of this. It, it really is an honor to be here uh, to speak with this outstanding panel, uh, to be at this institute on this occasion. I'd uh, particularly like to thank my friend, my dear friend Kate McIntosh um, and, and John for uh, facilitating this. Um, I admit what I'm going to be talking about is, is a mixture of impact and usage of I, um, ICTY jurisprudence in this area, because it's quite hard to measure impact in a lot of these cases. They, they cite the ICTY, but it's, it's quite hard to say, you know, this actually was a turning, turning point. Now, um, I'm going to talk about four 
um, situations, uh, four states, East, uh, East Timor, Indonesia, Cambodia, and Bangladesh. And I guess most people here are familiar with the, the Cambodia process. Uh, probably a little less so about East Timor, uh, probably know very little about Bangladesh, um, and even less about Indonesia. Um, Indonesia in particular, because you need to have spoken Indonesian to have understood what was going on. Um, now, all four of these countries since 2000 have engaged with a repression of atrocity. Uh, through justice mechanisms. Two of them internationalized and two of them totally domestic. Um, now, an overview of the, of, of, of the impact of the uh, ICTY's um, jurisprudence here. I've looked at the, the judgments. Um, and the judgments are full of ICTY, ICTR references, sometimes used correctly, sometimes not. However, the use of the ICTY's additional protocol uh, uh, jurisprudence, the, 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 the cases mentioned by, by, by the two, two judges and, and discussed by Patricia, is actually on the thin side, surprisingly thin. If we, um, uh, we're looking at, at cases prosecuted after 2000, but cases that also go back to 1975, 1975 for East Timor, um, 1975 for, for, for Cambodia, 1971 for Bangladesh. Um, and you would have thought that there'd be more additional protocol jurisprudence coming through. Um, four points I'll make on that. The first is there's an overwhelming preference for using crimes against humanity charges in all of these cases. That is the favorite charge. Um, the cases all skirt around the law of armed conflict, but there's a, there, there's a reluctance to engage head on uh, with, with, with them in terms of, of that particular uh, body of law. No litigation, there's, there's no shortage of opportunity to have engaged in, in cases of the Blaskic, um, of the Strugar, of the Perlich, of the Kordic, of the Ma, uh, um, Gotovina type cases, but they're not taking them, them up. Um, they've only got, in those four, four countries, only two grave breaches prosecuted, and they're both from Cambodia, both in relation to the same situation, which was maltreatment of Vietnamese prisoners of war. Um, a second point um, is that almost all of what has been prosecuted in those four jurisdictions has been crimes against civilians, which certainly could have been prosecuted as, as, as war crimes. Um, if you think in terms of the, the, the war in Bangladesh, the invasion, occupation of, of, of East Timor, um, various aspects of, of Cambodia, for sure. Now, a third point to note over here is the temporal aspect is, is relevant. As I've mentioned, 1971 for Bangladesh, 75 to 79 for um, Cambodia, uh, 75 to, to 99 for East Timor. So the law that they apply has to be seen in the light of this, but it also means that the ICTY jurisprudence and the ICTRs as well, for that matter, has to be carefully handled. Um, now, um, the ICTY's additional pro jurisprudence protocol, as used in this institution, has been concentrated in the areas of command responsibility um, and superior responsibility, um, although the conceptualizations are spelt out differently. Um, and the second most frequent usage is in the area of uh, what the meaning of civilians is. Uh, Judge, Judge Liu mentioned that as a major contribution, and the ICTY's um, jurisprudence is very um, on the, on, on also linking to crimes against humanity. Um, it's very much hinged on the nexus to an armed conflict. It makes sense to go to the additional protocols to figure out what, what um, civilian means when you've got uh, a crimes against humanity definition that's got a nexus. Well, that nexus doesn't appear in these other jurisdictions, but there's still um, a lot of, uh, of, of um, referral directly to the ICTY's jurisprudence um, um, in, this, in this regard. So those are two main areas. There are other areas, like looking at, at the jurisprudence for um, inhumane um, treatment. Um, I'll, um, I'll, I'll talk about um, Cambodia, uh, Bangladesh, Cambodia, skim through East Timor and Bangladesh, um, and, and then um, try and look forward, you know, what the future in the Asia Pacific, Pacific um, in terms of, of accountability mechanisms is, particularly in view of the ICTY's jurisprudence and the ICC. Um, so my first concrete example, having given you the overview um, uh, of, of drawing from the additional protocol um, jurisprudence on command responsibility, will come from Bangladesh. Um, 
the atrocities committed during the 1971 War of Liberation from, from Pakistan. Right, the, the courts there have used the ICTY jurisprudence on command responsibility. Um, that's Article 7.3, uh, which is, as, as, we, as I think most of us know, is taken from, from, from the additional protocols. It's also something that Judge Liu pointed out. Um, the command responsibility um, definition in the Bangladeshi legislation is very, very different. Uh, it's, a, it's a very peculiar provision that merges modes of responsibility. You have, command, you have elements of command responsibility there, but you've also got elements of ordering, um, permitting, acquiescing, participating in the commission uh, of, of crimes committed by subordinates. So it's a weird provision, um, and the tribunal there came under quite a lot of criticism uh, for, for not um, amending this, this, this law, and, use, and it was out of sync, if you like. Um, so one of the, one of the the uh, important issues that first comes up is, um, uh, is that are we justified in, in pursuing these command responsibility cases on the, ba on the basis um, of the law? And, the, and um, this, it comes up in most of the cases, but one of them I'll talk about, Ghulam Azam. Um, he was an Islamist um, leader, a polit political leader of the Jamaat Islamiyah party. Um, a political party, a politician, um, no direct link to the atrocities, no, no evidence of direct orders. But there were militia groups, paramilitary groups, Razakas, they called them peace commission, that were linked to, this, to, 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 the, to the party that were committing the atrocities along with the um, Pakistani army at, at, at that time. Um, so the, the court had to d delve into, 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 the, into this, their particular problematic legislation. And they use Celebici particularly and, and Blaskic um, for dicta that, that this is co the, um, this command responsibility. Um, it's, a, it's customary in international law, um, in, in, in international, non-international, um, also in relation to um, not just military but civilians. Right? So the civilians is important because we've got here a, a civilian um, who, who is being, being, being held into account, uh, to account here. We also have re references here to Aleksovsky, Kordic, Cherke. Somebody's been doing the ICTY uh, research um, over here. Um, so second, but there's something, some, some other, something else that goes on there. It's like using the ICTY jurisprudence as sort of a stamp of legitimacy. We're okay, we have that there. But you know, sometimes you have to go a bit deeper to see if it's been used correctly or in the right way. Um, so that's the first example. A second example of using the ICTY jurisprudence would come from Cambodia. And this is using the, the notion of what is a civilian not for, for, for um, war crimes, but for crimes against humanity, right? And it's been used, um, you, used um, ex uh, well, they've had, the, they're on, on, on to their second case is ending now. Um, uh, sorry, the third case is, is ending. Um, and they, the, they've had to look at it, in, particularly in, rela in relation to the two leaders' cases, um, the two, two surviving leaders of the Khmer Rouge. Um, they've relied on the, IC, on the ICTY's Article 50 uh, jurisprudence. Um, in general terms, what is a civilian, right? And they go and they look at the ICTY. ICTY looks at 7.3, looks, looks at, sorry, uh, looks at um, it, it, it's, um, Article 50 jurisprudence, right? Then they also look in, in the Cambodian context uh, and the matter of whether wounded soldiers can be considered civilians. Here, they look at the ICT jurisprudence as well. They follow it. Um, recently, what's come up in the, in, in, the, in the litigation is whether attacking one's own side can be an attack on the civilian population. So attacking your own side, we had have, we have the situation where the Khmer Rouge turned on some of its own cadre. Right? So in the context of a crime against humanity, well, can that be, can the, the, can the attack against the civilian population, if you're attacking your own, can it be uh, um, a crime against humanity? Uh, the, um, the ICTY jurisprudence indicates, no, it, it, it can't be a crime against, crime against humanity. Uh, the co international co-investigating judge, there's a complex structure in Cambodia, uh, recently called for amicus curiae and asked the parties for submissions uh, and came to, the, came to a very different conclusion um, opposite to the ICTY um, um, jurisprudence, if you like. Um, under customary law, international law applicable, he says, between 75 and 79, an attack by a state or organization against members of its own armed forces may amount to an attack directed at the civilian population, with the proviso 
that these persons are not allied with or providing military, militarily relevant support uh, for, to, to an armed group. So the reasoning is to do with gaps. It's the, 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 there might be a gap of pr protection in there. At least the, the crime against humanity concept that, 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 that would be there if there wasn't this kind of um, um, widening um, interpretation. And also central to this is the notion of no longer participating in hostilities. I'll be very brief now about the third and the fourth examples, Indonesia and East Timor, because they're, they're, they're really even, even thinner. Um, in Indonesia, you had a purely domestic process um, brought by Indonesia against the Indonesian military um, and a few Indonesian, um, well, you would say East Timorese uh, of ethnicity Indonesians in relation to what happened in East Timor in 1999. Um, so for, for the Indonesians, um, they, they prosecute this as um, gross violations of human rights, um, and this is genocide or crimes against humanity. No war crimes, right? We don't prosecute war crimes in, in Indonesia. Um, and command and superior responsibility comes up again. Also, well, and, and here they look at the ICTY jurisprudence again. Again, we have Blaskic again, we have Celebici. Um, what's also interesting is, uh, is uh, over here we're looking at non-international armed conflict. So they're applying the ICTY jurisprudence and they're doing these cases in about, ooh, uh, 2003 to 2004. Um, so they're applying, applying it, applying in a, what they consider a non-international armed conflict. East Timor was considered the 27th province of Indonesia, even though international, um, international lawyers say it was invaded, occupied, it was an occupied territory, um, international armed conflict, etc. cetera. Um, so we have it being used, you, you, ICTY jurisprudence being used in the conceptualization of command responsibility for the military as well as civilians. Um, in, in, in Indonesia. The last example is, is Timor-Leste itself, East Timor, um, Portuguese Timor, Timor Timor for the, for, for the Indonesians. Here, very interesting, we have no impact of the ICTY's additional protocol uh, jurisprudence, um, despite the, the, the story of this, you know, 25, 20 year, this invasion occupation uh, um, that lasts from 75 to 99. Um, several reasons for that. Um, um, I, I, one uh, um, being um, infrastructure, there just wasn't, there, there just wasn't the, the, the capacity in East Timor to go so far back into the, into the military conflict stage of things. It was, uh, there was a political impetus to look at a narrow period of time, which was 1999, which coincides with what the Indonesians were looking at. Looking at. So 1999 was seen in terms of crimes against, uh, against humanity. None of these cases that actually went to court involved command responsibility, so no need to look at the ICTY's jurisprudence on, on, on command responsibility um, and um, they didn't for some reason there's no referencing to even civilians in the juris in, in the jurisprudence it's quite clear it's obvious um, that who, who the target group are it's not been not, not not an issue the lawyers aren't bringing it up so the judges aren't looking at it even in the truth commission report that looks at the whole period. Um, there's 70 re references to the ICTY cases, 60 to the protocols. Um, we, have, we have our landmark cases going up to the period 2003, 2004, turning up there. Um, but we don't see them being used for the purposes of interpreting additional protocol one. So John's twitching next to me. Um, to recap, yeah. It's been the, the jurisprudence in these four jurisdictions way, uh, way, way far away from The Hague, um, used mainly in, in relation to command responsibility, to understanding the conceptualization of civilian for the purposes of crimes against humanity. Um, a few other situations where, where, which I haven't talked about, such as the meaning of inhumane acts. So what the future holds in the Asia Pacific region? You've got several live situations, ranging from the DPRK to Burma to Nepal to Sri Lanka. I mentioned two, Nepal. Nepal, a lot of pressure to hold accountability proceedings in relation to the non-international armed conflict. Um, but the discourse is about human rights. So if there's anything going to be prosecuted, it's going to be done as torture, as, disappear, as, as disappearance, um, as violations of the right to life. Sri Lanka is one where the ICTY jurisprudence really could come in. Um, but it, 
there's, there, there, there's, there is a lot of pressure on Sri Lanka to have, uh, to have an accountability process, two UN Commission reports, um, and even the UN Commission reports, I, I was quite disappointed with how little of the landmark ICTY jurisprudence was being used. Even for concepts such as proportionality, distinction, etc., they're going to ICJ cases, they're going to IC, ICRC customary study, uh, um, authors, but not ICTY jurisprudence for some, some, some reason. Um, so, um, so as the IC, as, as we as we move into that period, the ICC and complementarity start to start to become more important. But um, of course, the ICC will start look will be looking at the ICTY's jurisprudence, um, and it'll live on live, live on in in, in in that aspect. Um, so, um, on that note of living on, um, I think I'll end that. Thank you, Susanna. So, excellent. <laughs> Um, we've got about 10, 15 minutes, so I'll just jump straight into questions. Uh, uh, there's, well, like the gentleman here had his hand first, and then uh, just here as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is the Professor Zhang Yili from Korea. Uh, so, uh, I learned so much from Professor Liu and uh, uh, Suzanne. So, I'm wondering uh, why the Cambodia, 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 in that case, uh, why was not built international tribunal? for the criminal mm. compared to the, the ICTY. Mm. And uh, is there any particular background or not? Mm. This is my question. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. And it's just to be efficient, I think I'll take maybe three questions. And there was one here. Thank you. Thank you very much for the extensive information that we got uh, and uh, I really thank all the panelists for all this um, information. I'm asking because I, I visited the Srebrenica Museum, the, I mean the, Serbeni uh, the Srebrenica War Crime Museum which is in Bosnia, in Sarajevo. <clears throat> and um, uh, there, there was a lot of information missing like because there there are a lot of, of um, missing um, um, facts uh, that happened. I mean, a lot of, uh, of history that was not documented properly, especially those who, uh, were those uh, uh, victims who, whose families are unable to talk now because still the problems are still hurting. Um, is it uh, like in the future, will this, these cases be opened again and will there be, um, um, uh, will, be will, will there be uh, another uh, way of, uh, of uh, convicting and, uh, and um, putting uh, these people to judgment uh, if these people are uh, found? Uh, the second question, goes to Ms. Linton about uh, what's happening in, uh, in Burma now, because you skipped, Bur you mentioned Burma, but do you think this, uh, th what's happening uh, now uh, with the Rohingya Muslim uh, uh, tribes uh, escaping to Bangladesh, will this uh, reach uh, the, uh, will this become a crime against humanity also from the Burmese side? Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, there was a third question, I think. On this side, no. Someone else like another question? All right, I'll pass. I'll, I'm sorry, I'll open the, the first two questions. I don't, who would like to respond first? Judge Liu first. Judge Liu. Well, as for the uh, first question uh, concerning with the situation in Cambodia, uh, you have to know there's a lot of considerations. 
uh, first of all, they have to respect the sovereignty of that country. The United Nations signed agreement with the uh, 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 Cambodia government to set up a jointly uh, that kind of uh, hybrid or mixed, uh, you know, international tribunals to try those, you know, uh, criminals, which was hailed as a great, uh, you know, improvement, uh, you know, of the international uh, criminal justice, uh, because you know it's a very costly to hold a. Uh, international tribunal to try those, you know, uh, criminals, those uh, perpetrators, you know, whenever, you know, the crime occurs. So, so I think it all depends on the, uh, the, uh, the local government. The situation of the ICTY and the ICTR are totally different because when the ICTY was, you know, funded, there's still various armed conflict going on on the territory of the former Yugoslavia. So it is impossible to set up the tribunal on the territory of that, uh, you know, uh, of the former Yugoslavia. Uh, as for the uh, Rwanda, you know, the genocide just uh, happened. You know, the situation is not that stable. So the tribunal was set up in the uh, Alusha, the ICTR was set up in the uh, Alusha, rather in inside the territory of the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the Rwanda. So if, you know, the situation, you know, was better, uh, was improved, I think the best way is to set up the tribunal where the crime occurred. Thank you. Yeah. Is it on? Yes. 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 Um, uh, thank you so much for the for, for the two questions. There. Yes. Two. Well, uh, the the international tribunal and the Burma one. Um, yes. There's a very long story behind the Cambodia thing and why there is no international tribunal. As Judge Liu pointed out, the bottom line is the Cambodian government didn't want it and the international community was kind of fed up of international tribunals. Um, but you go back a little bit further, the, the, the question of accountability um, for the crimes uh, committed in Cambodia, um, that goes back way back to sort of like the 1979, 1980 all, already. Um, that two, there have been two Cambodian processes, one within the Khmer Rouge itself, one within the, um, the, the Vietnamese um, administrative, uh, Vietnamese, I wouldn't say control, well, the, 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 the successor regime uh, to, the, to, the, to the Khmer Rouge. Um, in the, and then there was the UN mission there. So there was talk about accountability then, but the UN mission came in in 1991. There hadn't been an ICT, ICTY comes in 1993. So that gets the dynamic going. Uh, towards the end of the 1990s, the Cambodian government actually asked for international assistance. Um, but then it backtracked and decided that it didn't want to do it. And then there was this process of persuasion um, and they, what they didn't want was an international tribunal which they couldn't control, and sovereignty totally comes into this. So what we end, end up having is, this, is, is, is an internationalized model where you have the internationals and, and, the, domestic, and the domestic. So the, the, that's what the international community wanted. Maybe not that particular model, but, but something, some, something that kept the Cambodians happy and met, met everybody. It's a bit, it's always like a win-win for Cambodia and a win-win for the, for, the, for the UN as such. I wouldn't call it a win-win for the victims. Uh, um, or um, some defense lawyers would say it's not a win-win for the, for the defense, uh, for the accused either. Um, so there's a long story to Cambodia. Um, in relation to, 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 to Burma, um, that's a political... Ultimately, the, these things are not... They're not, they don't turn on questions of, of law, they turn on questions of politics about whether somebody is going to do something or not. It could be crimes against humanity and it could be genocide. I mean, more and more people are talking about genocide and it's the targeting of, 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 of a particular uh, group. Um, and, uh, well, I, I suspect that right now it's not, talking about accountability right now is not the way to stop it. It's got it's, it's some, some sort of, as these, these things always are, some sort of diplomatic process, some kind of negotiated process, some um, dealing with the Burmese government to get them to stop it and then dealing with it. And the question of the sovereignty then, of course, comes in how do you deal with it? Um, Aung San Suu Kyi has been quite um, inclined towards the peace and reconciliation approach. You see that in the way that she is operating with, with the Burmese army itself. Um, so. Um, I would suspect if, if she was want, be wanting to push anything, she would be wanting to push for a Truth and Reconciliation Commission 
Um, but of course, there will be many, many, many voices calling for accountability, not just in relation to the Rohingya, but for the situation, the entire situation in, in, in Burma um, all, all, all these years. Thanks. Well, on this point, uh, um, uh, two issues. Uh, the choice between an international court or a, or a court based in the country, I don't repeat what Judge Liu has said, um, establishing an accountability mechanism has two purposes, actually. One is to take uh, the, the cases uh, in order to, um, to uh, on one hand, give some closure to the victims, and uh, on the other hand, uh, to try to re-establish a society to, uh, through justice to reconcile a society. But uh, there is also the preventive aspect, uh, which uh, if you are in war, the only way is to establish a tribunal outside. If the war has ended, you, uh, you don't have to establish for preventive purposes, because the, the crimes are not committed anymore, so you can concentrate on the other aspects. And there is no doubt that concentrating if you concentrate on reconciling a society and uh, on giving closure to victims, it's much better to have a court in, in the place where the crime occurred. There is no doubt. The distance is not a good solution. And that was what affected the ICTY in a way, because the ICTY um, could work well on establishing accountability, but then the reconciliation process the impact on the reconciliation process is very, very limited. In Bosnia, it's very, very limited. And I come to the other question, what happens with the crimes that have not been taken up? Uh, of course, uh, when uh, the situation in the countries of the former Yugoslavia become more stable, the local courts uh, uh, dealt with the, with the crimes. So there was, in parallel, cases before the ICTY and the cases before domestic courts. The ICTY itself, for lower rank accused, sent back cases to local courts. There are 13 cases that were sent back to the local courts in the former Yugoslavia because it was not necessary to deal with them at, uh, at uh, The Hague. But it remains that uh, uh, you asked uh, uh, what happens with the case not taken up. Well, according to the prosecution, there are now around uh, more than 5,000 cases that would have to be taken up in Bosnia. So uh, quite a huge number. The number 10 years ago was more than 10,000. Now, 5,000 have not been prosecuted. And uh, they can be taken up any time because there is no statute of limitation for international crime. So the, the law says that you can take the case forever. I mean, but there is a limitation, which is the, on one hand, uh, the, uh, the life of the accused, of the potential accused. <coughs> if they die, the case is over. You can't take the case anymore. And uh, there is, uh, the, for the prosecutor, the difficulty in dealing with cases that occurred 20, 30, 40 years ago in getting the evidence. Because also the witnesses die, also the evidence disappears. Uh, so the cases become completely impractical. But in principle, until the conditions for a, for a case exist, for a trial exist, they can be taken up any time. So what has not been dealt with uh, until now can be dealt with later, not by the international court. The international court ends. So in, uh, no case can be taken now before an international court in former Yugoslavia. But uh, uh, domestic courts should do their, uh, their job, actually. Well, regrettably, three minutes over time. 
Uh, I just want to thank the panel members. I think everyone here will agree that um, they have more than lived up to the introduction I gave um, an hour and a half ago. They've been each and every one of you, Judge Lou, Judge Polka, uh, Patricia Sellers, Susanna Linton, um, each of you have been truly fascinating to listen to. I want to thank you all and thanks to everybody for listening at this late hour. Thank you very much.